I, I, I wonder, we, we get on to flights of fancy and then come back to some of the things I'd like to talk about from, from books to furnish your life. But, um, what was it about, because this, this book is, an, an, again, talking about the two cultures, this is a very beautiful book as well. Jana, who, who uh, created the illustrations, it's a wonderful mix of a lot of ideas about natural selection, about our understanding of evolution, but also beautiful, sometimes mythic images, and then sometimes creatures, I mean, it reminded me a lot of that wonderful quote, again, I think probably Richard Feynman, uh, it nearly always is, it seems sometimes, which is the imagination of nature is far greater than the imagination of man. And that seems to run through a lot, I thought, of flights of fancy. You look at some of the behavior that's evolved, some of the structure that have evolved, and you think that the imagination of nature truly is grander than the things that we can very often perceive. Yes, there's something called Pop's third law, which says natural selection is cleverer than you are. And, and, and that, that shows up. Yes, um, well, Flights of Fancy, it, it, it's about flight, um, and it's about um, flight in, in evolution in animals and flight in, 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 in humans, because they face the same problem, problems. Physics is the same, and so the problems of designing a, a glider or a plane are similar to those that face a bird, or face natural selection in, des in designing a bird. And so, through the chapters, we go through um, powered flight, gliding flight, uh, um, being lighter than air, all, all these different ways of doing it, which, which in some cases the animals don't do. And one of the questions is why don't animals have balloons, have hot air balloons and, and, and float up? It seems they don't. They, they, none, no, no animal has ever evolved um, the equivalent of a, of, of a balloon. That's the kind of question we tackle. <laughs> um, and why did you decide this time? Why, why to, I mean, you, you start off at the beginning of the book to talk about the fact that this is, this is something that returns in your dreams, this sense of the idea of I flight. think most people dream about flying. It, it's, it's such a wonderful feeling of liberation to be, to be able to get off the, escape the tyranny of gravity and soar up into the air and over the treetops and... Um, so that's part of it. it. It actually grew out of an earlier book, The Magic of Reality, which is a children's book or a young people's book, in which each chapter was a question like, what is, why do we have winter and summer? Why do we have day and night? What is an earthquake? What is the sun? There are about 10 questions of that sort, and each chapter then has that question as their chapter heading. It begins with myths, about answering the question, myths about earthquakes, myths, myths about the seasons and so on, and then the science. And I think I originally thought that it might be nice to do a second volume of Magic of Reality with 10 more questions. But the first question was flight. And that became such a big subject that it grew into a whole book. So that, that, that's where it came from. And the myths, well, there's the myth of Icarus, of course, which is, which is in there, um, and the myth of Mohammed on a winged horse, um, and th then we get into, into the science. Um, but it's also partly more than just myth, it's the, it's the dream of flying, the dream of flying that inspired Leonardo da Vinci, who comes up several times in the book, his, de his desire to fly, his attempted design. He did design lots of flying machines, and none of them would have worked. But they were wonderfully ambitious and imaginative, as you'd expect. Well, that's one of the, on, on Da Vinci as well, the, the, the fact that a, a lot of people I know have always felt there's just not enough writing by Richard Dawkins about the nature of angels. And you go very deeply into looking at the angels, the, the wings of an angel, which I, I, I think is a, a, a beautiful well, yes. departure to then explore the nature of flight. Can you tell us a little they're, bit about... They're not, they're not big enough. Um, there's a... There's a um, <laughs> We, there's a picture uh, of um, Leonardo's Annunciation, a beautiful picture of the Annunciation by the angel Gabriel to, to the Virgin Mary. And Jana redrew it by giving the angel wings that might just have had a sporting chance of getting him off the ground. It was, um, they're pathetically small, the ones in the, in the original. If you're as big as a human, then flying is a really difficult problem. Leonardo tried it, or tried, designed it, it wouldn't have worked. The only time anybody succeeded in using human muscle power to get off the ground is, I think, Paul McCready, and we've got a, a, bit, a bit about him, 
who, who modified a glider, put a propeller on it, and had it propelled by a cyclist uh, cycling on board. And, and this thing had to be incredibly light and incredibly streamlined. It was so light that the, the cyclist on board was more than half the weight of the entire craft, which is a, a huge, great, great glider. And he, he won a competition. He just got across the English Channel, pedaling furiously all the way, about uh, 10 meters above the sea, and almost gave up in sight of the French coast, and just managed to struggle on and get there. But birds do it so effortlessly. It's, it, it, it's something to envy, and, what, and one of the reasons is that we're too big. So an angel would be too big to do flapping flight. You could glide. There have been flying animals as big as humans, as heavy as humans, which, but they probably only glide. I blame the popes. I would imagine it was, a, you know, they would, they would say, and I want 17 angels on yes, my ceiling. Yeah, yeah. And da Vinci would say, well, 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 I can't. And Michelangelo, they'd go, well, well they, I can only fit two angels because they've got huge wings. Make them smaller. Yes. So I would imagine it was papal intervention which yes. made the angels yes. ridiculous. Yes. Um, There's a rumour, actually, that, that Leonardo painted the wings originally even smaller than that. And some later artist tumbled to the fact that they're a bit small and enlarged them a bit, but nothing like enough. I love, I love that bit of the book, though, it's a, and it's so beautifully illustrated as well. Now, one of the things that I, I think is very important in terms of, again, looking at evolution by natural selection is, at one point you look at what's the point of half a wing? What's the point of only a bit of a oh, wing? Yes. And, of course, before you've, you've dealt with the eye, which was one of the most common questions thrown at you when debating with creationists or the entirely different intelligent design proponent. Um, and that again, seems to deal with some of that same area, which is... Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's a very nice... Um, it is one of the things I rather enjoy trying to talk about is, is this, what's the use of half of something? It happens to be a wing in this case, but it could be an eye, it could be all sorts of things. Um, the, um, the dilemma is this. It, you, can, you can accept that natural selection works. Once the, once the wing is kind of almost there, then natural selection could perfect it and make it even better. But how does it start? How does the initial um, projection from the body that's going to become a wing eventually, how could natural selection work on that when it actually wouldn't work? I mean, if the animal tried to fly with a little stub of a wing, a tenth of a wing, or, or even half a wing, it would just fall. And so... Um, You've got to think of somehow a gradient of improvement, a gradual ramp of improvement, starting from nothing and then gradually improving. And there are plenty of animals around that sort of, uh, sort of do that. They're gliding animals. They don't really fly. They live in forests, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, but in Africa as well, and Australia. And they have membranes which... In, in, in some cases, stretch from the arm to the leg. So it's like a squirrel. In fact, some of them are squirrels, flying, so-called flying squirrels. They're gliding squirrels. And squirrels have a fair bit of sort of loose skin around anyway. And so any little increase in the surface area that you can present to the air will give you just that little bit more purchase on the air. And so if you're a squirrel who's already leaping from branch to branch, and you can perhaps leap from, um, from here to um, that loudspeaker there. An ordinary squirrel could do, could do that. If it had a little bit more surface area, it could leap just that much further in a tree and survive without falling. So it doesn't matter how small is the increase in surface area that you put on your body, It'll get you just that much further. And somewhere up there in the, in the forest, in the, in the canopy of the forest, there will be a branch distance, which is just right for the next step, the next increase in surface area. And so starting from, well, ordinary squirrels just have a, a fluffy tail, which helps. Then these gliding squirrels that have, have a little bit of a memory, have a little bit of skin hanging down from your elbow, perhaps which gives you a little bit more surface area. Gradually, it gets larger and larger until it stretches from the arm 
to the leg. And these, squir these flying squirrels have, that, have this membrane. It's called a patagium. And they glide very successfully. They glide, <clears throat> oh, 100 yards or so, um, starting from a high tree and then leaping and then gliding to another tree 100 yards away in the forest and landing in, on the base of the other tree and then they can climb up that, that tree. There are um, so-called flying lemurs, which do the same thing. They're not lemurs, but they're called flying lemurs. Um, and in, that, in their case, the membrane extends to the tail as well. So in, in effect, the whole body is one big parachute. And again, they don't really fly, but they glide. There are Australian marsupial gliders in the eucalyptus forests of Australia, which do the same thing and look exactly like the flying squirrels of Africa and Asia. There are two different groups of rodents. There's the flying squirrels and there's another group of, of, of rodents which do the same thing. Um, then there are frogs which, which do the same thing using uh, the skin between their toes and fingers. They stretch their, have elongated fingers and toes and they use that as a flight sur surface. There are lizards which um, don't use the limbs. They have their, their ribs stick out. They, they can stick their ribs out and the ribs have skin between the ribs, which again acts as a flight surface. So all these are demonstrations of what can be done with half a wing. And the flying squirrels and the flying lemurs, while they're gliding, they could do a certain amount of adjustment, like parachute, parachute um, humans with parachutes can, by pulling strings, they can, or hang gliders can do, do the same kind of thing. Um, so there's, it's not that much a difficult bridge to cross, to go from gliding and then having a, a controlled glide by moving your limbs as you glide to actually flapping. So it's easy to imagine the gradient of, st of steady improvement in evolution from something like a flying squirrel. Um, there's another theory, which is that it's, that, that's called the, the trees down theory. And there's also the, the, the ground up theory, which some people think is more probable for birds. It, it, it is developed from leaping off the ground, pouncing off the ground perhaps, uh, leaping a, to get away from a predator or pouncing if you are a predator. And then uh, once again, any increase in surface area gives you a little bit more, uh, get a little bit more distance that you, that you can jump to. So there's the ground up theory and the, and the trees down theory. I prefer the trees down theory. I think, I think it's more plausible, but well, two theories is better than one in some ways. <laughs> do, do you think, just listening to you talk about that, is one of the problems that people have in terms of understanding the nature of evolution that it is over such an enormous oh, amount of, course, of time? Because yes. as you talk about, yeah. it can be tiny, 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 tiny difference yeah. in a branch. And the human, again, when we talk about the problems of human brains perceiving ideas, we talk about quantum mechanics, but even the idea of perceiving a million years. Yes. Um, I think... A, a few thousand years, we get a sort of frisson of, of the romance of history going back to Babylon or something, and you think, gosh, 1,000 years, 3,000 years, 4,000 years, that's a tremendous time. Of course, it's nothing. And, and, and a, a million years is really pretty sh peanuts compared to evolution. Um, but the other thing, of course, is that um, people calculate how long it would actually take to evolve something, and it's much shorter than you think. So um, even something as complicated as an eye um, could be evolved really quite quickly if there was a strong selection pressure. But it's perfectly true that the, that the time scale involved is so gigantic that the human brain simply can't begin to comprehend it. Now, and another thing on flight as well, which I'm always fascinated, sometimes it seems we look at certain processes, such as the evolution of the ability to fly, and imagine that it goes, that's the direction of progress. But then, as you say, there are, in the book, there are also examples where flight 
is lost as an ability, that it no longer becomes an advantage. It, it reminds me of, I think, in Steve Jones's book, Almost Like a Whale, I think it was the first time that I realised that, or found out that a whale had had a period of time out of the sea, you know, the, what, the previous, before it was a whale, you know, that its ancestor had been a land mammal. And, and that seems so counter-instinctual to me. You see the progress of out of the sea and into the air. And so I find that fascinating Absolutely, as well. Absolutely, I, I quite agree. Um, by the way, uh, tortoises, I love this because you, you say, you know, whale ancestors, they, they, originally they were fish, they came out on the land, and then they trooped back into the sea again after a, after a certain time. Tortoises came back again. So, so originally their ancestors were fish like all of ours. They came onto the land and lived as land tortoises for a while. Then they went back into the water like whales and became turtles. And then t turtles came back onto the land and became tortoises. Um, so they did a double, double back. Um, I love that. That's, it's like those people who sometimes in, in their 80s return to where they lived as children and then go, oh, actually, it's not how I remember it. Let's go back out again. Yes, I think that's yes, a... yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, how did we get into that? It, it was... Um... Sorry, no, oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, uh, losing, losing wings. Um, yes, uh, it's very, very common for birds, when they get on an island and they find there are no predators, um, they tend to lose their wings and... Um, there are the d dodos, for example, are a, a nice example, but there are, there are really hundreds of different cases where island birds have become flightless. Uh, Galapagos flightless, cormorants, lots of, um, lots of other birds do. Um, even things like ostriches and elephant birds and moas, which are gigantic now, their ancestors, had, their ancestors must have flown. They've got wings, they're just little, little stubby wings, they've lost them. Um, and they've grown big now, but originally, almost certainly, a very long time ago, in, in the case of ostriches and ratite birds, they, they must have lost them probably on, on islands when they found they weren't necessary anymore. It's an interesting question why, just because you don't need something, you don't need wings anymore, why you actually bother to lose them? I mean, why not just hang on? They might come in handy one day. Um, but they do lose them. This must be economics. One of the... One of the messages that recur through flights of fancy is economics, the fact that everything in biology is about economic trade-offs. And so it's costly to make wings, it's costly to make flight muscles. I mean, you think of muscles on a chicken, which is not a great flyer, but even chickens, you can see this huge breast muscle that they have. That's another, th another sort of joke we have, is the, is the size of the breast muscle that the angel Gabriel must have had, if you were going to... <laughs> The fly, huge keel to stick to, to join it onto. Um, I can't wait for your next book, The Problem with Angels. No, no, it's gonna, no, no. they're not expecting Actually, it. The Bishop of Leeds was not expecting that one to come out. Actually, there's not much on angels. It's, 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 there, there, there was more, <laughs> but the publisher wanted me to cut it out. See, it's, 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 it's the opposite of Darwin and the pigeons, isn't it? That yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, losing wings, I mean, the most dramatic example of losing wings is Queen Ants. Um, which, having been on their one time in their life when they ever used their wings to, to mate with, they then settle down, having mated, and for, mated for life, settle down, bite their wings off or tear them off, in, and then go underground and spend the rest of their life underground. Of course, worker ants don't, don't have wings, but queen ants and queen termites do have wings for dispersal, for their, for their mating flight. So, but biting your wings off is a dramatic example of why wings aren't necessarily a good thing. And they sort of epitomize for me um, the, in, in, in real time, you actually watch it happening, but in real time they're showing what happened in evolutionary time with the ancestors of dodos and ostriches and elephant birds and flightless cormorants, etc.